Welcome to the presentation for Nursing 150. This presentation will uh, explore osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout. We will discuss risk factors for these disease processes, um, pathophysiology a little bit, and go into the nursing care of these patients with these um, musculoskeletal disorders. Osteoarthritis is a progressive deterioration and loss of cartilage in one or more joints. Key words in that statement is progressive, deterioration, and joints. So that's where it occurs. Essentially, it is known as a deterioration of the joints. Osteoarthritis um, is known for the uh, kind of also known as like an overuse um, disease of the joints. So um, people who are older, people who have had a joint injury. So it's the combination of many factors that causes osteoarthritis. Um, patients, there it, it is broken down into primary and secondary causes for osteoarthritis. Primary um, osteoarthritis is known to be a disease of the aging. The weight-bearing joints are the most commonly effective, so it's the knees, the hips, the back, the lower back typically. If you think about it, these joints are the ones that we use day after day after day, walking, bending, kneeling, bending over. Um, those are thought to be affected the most because those are the joints that we use most often in a daily basis. Secondary causes of osteoarthritis is um, occurs left less less often. Um, typically, it's related to a joint injury or obesity. Obesity can um, cause wear and tear on the joints because it's just an extra um, burden on the joints. There is a vi video posted in your toolbox about the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis. Um, I think that will be helpful in understanding the development of osteoarthritis. If you read through it in your book, it's, it's um, a little complicated. Um, they talk about enzymes uh, breaking down in the matrix, the synovial fluid, things like that. So um, you can read through that and then watch the video. I think that will ha help you have a, a good understanding of the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis. This is a great picture to understand the degeneration that occurs in the joint. Um, the healthy bone is seen here. You can see how it's there's articular cartilage. Um, the two bones are connected here. This is a knee joint. Um, and as you can see, things should move smoothly. The movement of the joint should move smoothly. Here you can see there's spurring of the femur. There's degenerated cartilage. Um, and you can see how this one could be a lot more painful for your patient. Again, key things about osteoarthritis, this is degeneration of the joint, causing your patient to have pain and discomfort. One thing to mention here with this, this, this degenerated joint that we have here, um, the cartilage is disintegrating. There's pieces of bone. As you can see, it says spurring pieces of bone come off. Eventually, it'll cause a sound when the patient moves their knee called crepitus, which is a grating sound caused by loosened bone and cartilage. The resulting joint pain and stiffness can lead to decreased mobility and muscle atrophy, which means muscle um, loss. Muscle tissue helps support joints, so it's, it, it can lead to um, a decreased range of motion in this joint. I don't know if you know anybody that has a little crepitus in their joints. Um, if you you can you know when they bend their knee, you can hear a little grinding. That's crepitus. That means there's it's degenerated. Um, I already went over the causes for primary and secondary osteoarthritis. Um, again, primary is typically aging and genetics, and that commonly affects the knees, the hips, and the lower back, the vertebral column. Secondary osteoarthritis is often um, is less found less often than primary, but it um, affects the people typically with some obesity, so it's secondary to obesity. 
and it's uh, injury from a joint. Sometimes if someone has uh, maybe been in a car accident that uh, had a broken bone or something, um, sometimes later in life it can cause some arthritis degeneration in that joint. Professional athletes often develop a secondary osteoarthritis, secondary to their um, increased use of their joints. So that constant training, running, um, maybe sometimes they might have an injury due to their, their sport. So they are at high risk for developing osteoarthritis. A lot of times people who have obesity um, develop osteoarthritis, like I said, the secondary. Um, a lot of times the doctor will talk to them about losing weight, and sometimes that can help uh, decrease the progression of the disease process of osteoarthritis. So assessing a patient for osteoarthritis. First of all, history. We always kind of start out with the history, talking about what you know their signs and symptoms. Discussing pain, signs and symptoms of pain with patients. Um, talking about if they have joint stiffness, for how long, do they have swelling, how do they control the pain, um, do they have loss of mobility or difficulty with range of motion or doing their activities of daily living. Osteoarthritis does occur uh, more often in older women, so talking about age, gender, taking that into consideration as far as your physical assessment. History of obesity would be significant here because we know that patients that are obese are at higher risk. Any family history of arthritis is important. Initially, patients typically will complain of chronic joint pain and stiffness. Uh, usually, the pain can be relieved by rest in the early phases of arthritis. Later, um, when the, the arthritis is a little bit more degenerative, they they the pain will occur with even slight range of motion. Assessing them, the, pain, the patient may have um, pain with, um, you know, with, with moving the joint, with palpation. They might, when you are kind of pushing on their joint, they may have pain. Crepitus, again, remember what that is. It may be heard um, when, at, when going through a range of motion with the patient. Joint enlargement may be noted. Um, it can cause some edema. It's important to know that osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease, not typically inflammatory disease. So if there is inflammation in the joint, it's usually a secondary inflammation of the synovial. So, and that's typically a more, um, more, advanced osteoarthritis in a patient who has this uh, inflammation of their synovial. And if you think back to your um, anatomy and physiology um, of the synovial, it, it um, lubricates the joint. It secretes synovial fluid, which lubricates the joint. That's its role um, in every joint. Some other joints that can be affected are the joints of the hand. Osteoarthritis in the hand if a patient develops inflammation in their joints of their hand, they might develop swelling, um, which are known as Herberdern's nodes or Borchard's nodes. And I believe I have a picture of those um, on the next slide of those. And it's a de, a de, um, essentially just some swelling of their knuckles. Um, remember when your mom told you when you were a kid to stop cracking your knuckles if you're one of those people that you're going to get arthritis? Eh, maybe mom was actually right because that constant cracking and pulling on that joint can actually cause some degeneration in that joint. So um, you'll see some swollen knuckles, which um, for chards is your um, proximal knuckle, so it's the knuckle in your middle finger. Herberdern's is a uh, swelling of the most distal knuckle that you have in your hand, which is down by your fingernail. So major things um, associated with osteoarthritis that are kind of big issues for us as nurses is that it does cause the patient to have pain. It can cause them to have joint swelling and decreased range of motion, which means loss of function or mobility, um, which we know can possibly lead to falls. 
If a patient is not able to be as active as they would like to be, they can gain weight. We know that activity is healthy as far as cardiovascular wise. It's healthy as far as your emotions, you feel better when you can get up and move around, things like that. So those are the things that the nurse takes into consideration when taking care of these patients. So treatment, let me back up a second before I go into treatment. Let's look at labs. As far as osteoarthritis, there are no major tests that can be help us to definitively diagnose osteoarthritis. There's a couple of labs that they may look at um, but just note that these labs are more definitive for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the ESR, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, is, and if that is elevated, if the ESR is elevated, that indicates inflammation in the body. There's a little bit, there's one that's a little bit more even detective of inflammation in the body. It's C-reactive protein. Um, that can indicate inflammation in the body. If a patient does have, like I said, osteoarthritis can lead to a secondary inflammation. Um, so if there is that secondary inflammation, that synovial inflammation, these two labs may be elevated. And we'll talk about these tests a little bit more with rheumatoid arthritis because rheumatoid arthritis is noted to be a little bit more inflammatory than osteoarthritis because remember, it's degenerative. Treatment. Um, so let's think about our problems that these patients might have before we talk about exactly what the treatment is. Pain is definitely um, a problem and decreased mobility. So we have to look at those two problems and see how we can treat that. Typical um, treatment for pain, non-surgical management of chronic joint pain can be challenging. Acetaminophen is the um, drug of choice for osteoarthritis. It's your, your good old Tylenol because it is because it is an analgesic. If your patient does have an elevated ESR C-reactive protein in an osteoarthritis patient indicating that they do have that synovial inflammation, we can go ahead and give them a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, but typically um, if there's no inflammation present, we'll go ahead and go with acetaminophen. There are, um, it is important to know that acetaminophen does have a limit, um, no more than three grams daily of acetaminophen due to the fact that it can cause liver disease. Patients who have a history of alcoholism or other types of liver disease um, can really not take acetaminophen because it is metabolized in the liver and large amounts of acetaminophen over three grams a day can damage the liver. So there is a little bit um, of just some patient teaching and um, monitoring of these patients. The important thing is to tell them a lot of patients think that acetaminophen is just super safe because it's over the counter. However, they need to know, sometimes we'll have those patients that think that if two works great, well I'll just take four because I'm really in pain today, um, but they have to know that they can't do that. You can only take three grams of acetaminophen today. You can't just take a bunch of them just because it's over the counter. There are some topical drugs that can be applied, and sometimes these can be pretty effective, although I have heard that they're expensive. Um, lidocaine patch is um, one that can be applied to the area, although the hip, it usually works pretty well. But the knees, it's difficult to apply a patch to the knee because the joint, that, the way that joint moves, it doesn't typically stay there. Um, but it can be effective like for lower back and hips. I've heard it's pretty effective. Again, it's kind of, um, it's kind of expensive. Um, one thing to make sure you know, it, it, the application of a patch requires that the nurse wear gloves and um, wash their hands and then make sure you monitor the site where you're applying the patch for any kind of skin irritation. We will talk um, a little bit more about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications as we talk about rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so we'll talk about that and how that uh, can be effective in treating if there's synovial inflammation or if the patient has rheumatoid arthritis. We'll talk about the NSAIDs then. There are non-pharmacologic 
interventions that can be done for osteoarthritis as far as nursing care. If we can get the patient on a regimen of rest, balance with exercise, joint positioning, heat or cold applications, weight control is a very important piece of it, um, a, a variety of other complementary and alternative therapies. Physical therapy, um, helping a patient do therapy and do activity that is safe and um, non-painful for them. Application of heat and cold can be used for temporary relief of pain. There are special treatments uh, that physical therapy can help with, such as paraffin drips, um, ultrasound waves. A great activity for a patient who has osteoarthritis is swimming or being in the water. Basically, they can do activity with, um, and the water decreases the pressure on the joints. And always, always, always in most of the disease processes that we will go over in this course, the nurse's job talking to the patient about eating a balanced diet um, for optimal weight and um, health, overall health, always will be helpful. So we always want to talk to them about eating a balanced diet that, and keeping a healthy weight. And typically um, that can help reduce their risk for disease processes. There are some supplements that have been known to potentially um, decrease the progression of osteoarthritis. Dietary supplements such as glucosamine and chondroitin um, have been widely identified as supplements that could potentially decrease pain and improve functional ability. There's, um, the evidence to support this is um, inconsistent. However, it's, um, they are natural supplements. So uh, they are natural supplements that are found in bone cartilage. So glucosamine may decrease inflammation and chondroitin may play a role in strengthening the cartilage. They are typically taken um, orally. And there is a table in your book about the considerations for taking glucosamine supplements. Always, always, always the key um, for any supplements is that the patient must discuss this with their physician before taking due to the fact that sometimes supplements interact with other, other medications or other, maybe it could interact or um, cause problem with any other health issues that they have. So the important thing with supplements is that they always need to talk to their doctor about it and um, before taking it and making sure it's safe for them. Glucosamine chondroitin itself um, can interfere if a patient has hypertension. Um, they sh people who are pregnant should not take it. Anticoagulant therapy, they should not take it or they should monitor for bleeding. Diabetics, um, it can affect their blood sugar. So there's a few different things to consider for glucosamine chondroitin. From what I've read about it, typically glucosamine chondroitin is not helpful if the patient has a very advanced degeneration of their joint. Um, it's, it tends to be more effective if they take it early on in the disease process. It's also, also important to note that there is surgical co correction for a patient who has osteoarthritis Surgical management of a patient with osteoarthritis um, can be a total joint arthroplasty or a total joint replacement. The people that um, are qual qualify for surgical management are those that um, have chronic pain and that is difficult to manage non-surgically. Um, so the surgery is done to manage pain and to improve mobility. The joints most typically replaced uh, for osteoarthritis are knees and hips. If you're going to be working your clinical component on the joint and spine center, you will take care of many of these patients who are receiving a new, new knee or um, a new hip joint. So it's very important to review in your book um, about the pre-op care of a patient who is undergoing a joint replacement. A lot of it is educating them prior to the procedure if we have time, letting them see um, a DVD or some kind of uh, video that tells them what the procedure is, 
Um, also, it's important to begin to talk to them about what they're going to be doing postoperatively as far as physical therapy. It's important um, to go ahead and start educating them right away about what they're going to get, need to be doing in order to have good outcomes after their surgery. And it, think about all those things that you may have learned about taking care of a patient who's undergone a procedure. Major, major keys for taking care of a patient post any procedure is um, prevention of pneumonia and that is using your IS and prevention of DVT which is activity putting those SCDs on those sequential compression devices those TED hose so think about all those things that is a that is a responsibility of a nurse for uh, post-op care of a patient um, in order to prevent complications. We're also monitoring them for signs and symptoms of infection. So we'll be doing vital signs, checking for any signs that we might see that there's any complication. Pain management is also huge with these patients. They, it can be a painful surgery. So we're gonna make sure that their pain is under control so that they recover well. There is a chart in your book that covers the post-operative care, key features of post-operative care of an older adult with a tittle hip. It is highly encouraging, it's, I highly encourage you to review these um, tables that are presented in your book about caring for a patient after a hip repair and after a knee repair. There's special hip precautions um, that we need to know about to take care of a patient who's had a hip joint replaced. Um, most of that is the fact that they cannot um, bend their knee more than 90 degrees. Um, there's some pictures in your book to help with that. Um, they typically kind of have to um, not put a lot of pressure on that new joint, so bending their leg 90 degrees would put a lot of pr uh, pressure on that hip joint. So um, it's important to understand what their activity limitations are and just how to take care of these patients post-procedure. So make sure you review that. We'll talk about that more in class as well. Okay, moving on to talk about rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is a connective tissue disease that can be destructive to the joints. It is chronic, it is progressive, and the big, big difference between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis is this part here. It's a systemic autoimmune disease. Remember the major words with osteoarthritis was degenerative um, and with rheumatoid arthritis the cause of this type of arthritis is a systemic inflammatory autoimmune disease. Autoimmune, it's important to have an understanding of what the definition of autoimmune is because we're going to be talking a, a lot about autoimmune diseases in this course. Autoimmune means the body's immune system has identified something in it and has identified it as foreign. So let's back up here for a minute. Your immune system is trained or, uh, you know, made to protect us from things that it determines is foreign, something that we should not have. So it protects us. There are times when it's hypersensitive, this immune system is hypersensitive, and it identifies something within our bodies that and, and thinks it's foreign when actually it's not. So it will try to attack it, which causes inflammation. So autoimmune means that the body has identified something as foreign that's actually not, um, and it's attacking itself, kind of. I hope that makes sense. Um, if you need to review that a little bit, um, just make sure you review what autoimmune means, because again, we're going to be talking about that a lot in this course. Um, there is a video that I posted in the toolbox about rheumatoid arthritis. I encourage you to watch it. It does help you understand the pathophysiology of it. Synovial joints, um, it's, I just put that on there because we already talked about synovial joints and osteoarthritis. That's another thing that you want to make sure that you have an understanding of what a synovial joint is because osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis will attack the synovial joints. Synovial joints are most movable joints in the body. Um, they consist of a joint cavity, a synovial cavity, and synovial fluid. 
So the synovial cavity it secretes the synovial fluid that lubricates the joint as we move um, continuously. There's articular cartilage that covers the end of the opposing bone. So like if you're talking about your, your knee, you're talking about your tibia, your fibula, and your femur. How those the ends of those bones between them, uh, at the ends of them there's articular cartilage, and then there's the synovial sac between them that lubricates that and helps that joint move easily. Um, there's also reinforcing ligaments that holds the um, that connects the bone, the bursa which helps to helps the movement of the joint as well. So just make sure that you do um, kind of review the anatomy and physiology of a joint. It will help you understand um, exactly how these joints are affected by osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. So again, talking about the definition of rheumatoid arthritis, there's these rheumatoid factors that are formed as a result of an autoimmune response. It attacks the healthy tissue. So basically it's identifying this healthy tissue as something foreign and attacking it. It especially attacks the synovium, causing inflammation. Remember the synovium secretes the synovial fluid um, and that's what keeps our joint healthy. So um, these, these, in this case with rheumatoid arthritis, the synovium is attacked uh, and causes inflammation within the joint. It's important to again remember that rheumatoid arthritis is systemic. That means it can affect other areas of the body. Osteoarthritis is not systemic. It is local. So that's how um, we can kind of identify the differences. The other key word with arthri rheumatoid arthritis is the word inflammation. If we talked about osteoarthritis, the big word there is degeneration. And rheumatoid arthritis, sorry my handwriting's bad here, and rheumatoid arthritis the key word is inflammation. Now remember someone with osteoarthritis can become inflamed, their synovium can become inflamed and that's a little bit more advanced osteoarthritis that has created um, inflammation of the synovial. Inflammation is the key thing with rheumatoid arthritis, and it can be systemic, which means it can affect other areas of the body. Key things with rheumatoid arthritis, like I said, with really most disease processes that we're going to talk about in this course, is to identify it early and to treat it early. The patient outcomes will be much more improved if we identify it early and treat it early. There is a chart in your book. It's called The Patient with Rheumatoid Arthritis. Um, talks about the early manifestations. Earliest manifestations is typically inflammation. Um, they can develop a low-grade fever, fatigue, and weakness and anorexia. That is due to the systemic effects of rheumatoid arthritis. Later on in the progression of rheumatoid arthritis, the patient can develop bone deformities. Um, a lot of times you will, what you've probably seen in the past is deformities in people's hands. Um, they also develop moderate to severe pain. Rheumatoid arthritis is famous for morning stiffness. They typically have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning. The patient's joints will be slightly red, warm, stiff, and swollen, tender, and painful. Rheumatoid arthritis differs from osteoarthritis in that it is typically bilateral, so it'll affect like both hands or both knees, for instance. The number of joints involved usually increases as the disease progressive progresses. The joint deform the hand deformities that um, occur in rheumatoid arthritis are different than that of osteoarthritis. You can tell by these pictures. Typically, it affects. Um, more the lower part um, of the hand, these knuckles here, um, and it causes more of a deform, deformity rather than just swollen knuckles like osteoarthritis can. Etiology or cause of rheumatoid arthritis is not 
terribly clear. And you're going to find this about most of the autoimmune diseases that we're going to talk about. Causes are really unknown. There's thought to be some genetic disposition to it and a combination of environmental factors as well. Physical assessment, think about this after what we just talked about in the slide. So if a patient has pain in the joint, they come in and they complain of pain, think about how you would further assess them to determine whether it's a rheumatoid arthritis or not. What symptoms would they present with according to what we just spoke about? Remember we said that it is systemic. So, you know, checking their vital signs, do they have a low-grade fever? Um, is it more than one joint? Is it bilateral or is it unilateral? Um, what does their joint look like? Checking their range of motion. Is it swollen? Does it look inflamed? Talk about their past medical history, their family history, those types of things to help you determine whether this is a rheumatoid arthritis or not. The pattern um, of joint involvement. Typically with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it, like I said, it's bilateral and symmetrical, like it might be both wrists. They will have, might complain of hot, swollen, painful joint and a general feeling of not feeling well at all, a poor appetite. Um, so think about that. As a nurse, that's what our, kind of our part is, is understanding the disease process and then when a patient complains of pain, identifying, can you assess what type of pain it is? Um, get a history on it. Where is it at? Is it involved one joint, two joints? And exactly what does the joint look like? Is it red and swollen? How long has this been going on? What, what are you doing for it? What works to help ease the pain? Things like that. Concerns, nursing concerns. How is this affecting their mobility? How is their pain affecting their daily life? Um, are they going to have falls? Are they going to, um, you know, have further systemic issues related to this? So think about as a nurse, if you were taking care of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, what concerns would you have? Laboratory assessment is a great way for us to determine whether a patient has rheumatoid arthritis. It helps support the diagnosis. The test for rheumatoid factor measures the presence of those unusual antibodies. Um, remember, those antibodies is what we would build up in our system to fight against um, uh, uh, something that we determine is foreign. So if we have those antibodies, that means that it um, certainly would um, support the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. The anti-nuclear antibody or an ANA test measures a group of antibodies that destroy the nuclei of cells and cause tissue death in patients with autoimmune diseases. You will hear ANA again and again and again. Anti-nuclear antibody. That's a, that's a blood test that we do that can tell us if there's an autoimmune process going on in the body. If that is positive, that would indicate to us that it would, it certainly points way more towards rheumatoid arthritis than osteoarthritis. There's a very good chart in your book called Con Connective Tissue Disease that talks about the laboratory profile and it explains erythrocyte, sedimentation rate, and ANA and rheumatoid factor. Normal range of rheumatoid factor is negative. If it's positive, it indicates a possibility of rheumatoid arthritis. There's one more test, the C-reactive protein. There's another, and I already mentioned that um, in some slides for osteoarthritis, that it can help us to measure inflammation in the body. I also just wanna mention as far as other diagnostic tests that we can do, a standard X-ray can be used to visualize the joint and deformities. A CT scan can help determine the presence and degree of cervical spine involvement. Atherocentesis is an invasive procedure, but it can be used for patients with joint swelling. If they have excessive synovial fluid, we can do that at the bedside 
They numb the area and basically aspirate a sample of the synovial fluid. A couple things, we reasons why we do this, it relieves the pressure on the, on the joint and the fluid can be analyzed for inflammatory cells, including a rheumatoid factor. So that can help us again definitively diagnose if it's rheumatoid arthritis or not. It's important to understand that as a nurse, we need to monitor patients that are going, undergoing diagnostic tests. If it's just a conventional x-ray, there's no prep. We just have to make sure that they're not pregnant. Um, CT scan is pretty easy and painless. However, we do, again, have to make sure that they're not pregnant. It's important to note if somebody's getting a CT scan with dye, with IV, IV dye, sometimes we do that with contrast. A CT with contrast, that's a whole other story, and we'll talk about that in the course, in the modules to come. Um, if we do a CT with contrast, that means we are injecting contrast into their veins or they're drinking it, so we have to make sure that they're not allergic to any dye. Some of the dyes have iodine in them, so an iodine allergy would be um, contraindicated for using um, IV dye. So it's important to ask those questions prior to doing those tests. Um, make sure you understand how to take care of a patient after if we do an atherosynthesis, so that means when we go in and um, aspirate fluid from their joint. Afterwards, you just want to monitor the site for bleeding or leaking um, and make sure that they just um, recover well. If they have increased pain or anything like that, you would want to report that. So treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, let's talk about the definition of it. It is an inflammatory problem. It's an autoimmune problem. So we need to give them treatment that decreases inflammation and decreases the autoimmune response. The goal of treatment for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis is that the patient will um, we can slow the progression, we can manage their pain, prevent joint destruction, and support mobility. Drug therapy and non-pharmacologic interventions include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications because again, remember one of the problems here is inflammation. So if we give them an anti-inflammatory medication, hopefully that will decrease the inflammatory response. It's important to note if we, if a patient is taking non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications that um, these do cause some GI upset. So we need to make sure that we monitor and, and teach the patient to um, report any GI upset with taking these medications. The risk for GI irritation, which is gastrointestinal irritation and gastrointestinal bleeding, is high with non steroidal anti inflammatory meds. So it's important to educate your patient about that if they are taking that. First line medications for um, rheumatoid arthritis are disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs such as methotrexate. It's immunosuppressive, so remember I said it's, it, it is autoimmune is the problem, so it suppresses the immune system so that the, the, it decreases that inflammatory response, that immune response. Most of these drugs come with, um, with the concerns and come with some side effects, so they have to be used with caution. So again, I said these are the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, so they're known as DMARDs. Methotrexate is one of those in that category. Typically, um, we have to monitor, as nurses, monitor for the desired therapeutic effects, such as decrease in joint pain and swelling. And also, it can cause some decrease in their white blood cells, so it can suppress their immune system so much that they're at risk for infection. So we have to tell our patients that, that they're at risk for an infection. So they need to avoid crowds, ill people who are ill, um, and they just need to be really on the lookout for washing their hands, 
making sure that they're doing measures to prevent, prevent themselves from getting any kind of illness because their immune system is suppressed. There are also medications listed called the biological response modifiers. Again, what they're trying to do is suppress that hyper autoimmune response. Um, so, we're tr so essentially what these do is suppress your immune system. So it works for um, decreasing that hypersensitive autoimmune response, but it can also suppress the immune system so much that they put the patient at risk for infection. So that's typically the major teaching topic for patients who are on these medications. These medications are listed in um, a chart in your book um, as far as, you know, purpose, side effects, and things to teach your patient. We will go over some of these topics in class, and, but I highly encourage you to get into your um, med search book and review those in the chapters identified on your topical outline. So truly, when we look at nursing here, as far as medication, pharmacologic interventions for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, it's um, teaching them about the treatment that's chosen for them and making sure that they understand the treatment and that they are getting the desired effects of the treatment. Other non-pharmacologic interventions for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, um, adequate rest, proper positioning, application of heat and ice, can help with pain management. If there's an acute inflammation, ice packs can be applied, but make sure you understand how to do that safely. Remember, you never apply heat or ice directly to the skin, and you never leave it on for long periods of time. It's usually 20 minutes at a time. Heated paraffin wax also helps to decrease the discomfort, especially in the hands. Exercises are often um, helpful to decrease the stiffness. So safety as well, if they have decreased range of motion to their joints due to pain and swelling, we have to look for safety and help them with their mobility. It's important to encourage the patients to continue moving even though it's painful. Actually, it's worse if they do not continue to try to be active. They're so they're super stiff in the morning when they get up. Um, so what they need to do is get up and get maybe a warm bath, a warm shower. That warmth of the shower can help loosen up those joints and decrease the stiffness. Uh, but it's very, very important that they continue to keep moving as tolerated. That's why a lot of patients with rheumatoid arthritis need physical therapy to help them continue to move their joints Loss of, um, loss of moving in activity can actually make it worse. So we want them to continue. So it would be short sessions. They're not going to go marathon sessions or run a marathon, but they still have to have some activity. So getting, getting encouraging them to continue moving is really the best thing for them. So that's why it's very important to control their pain so that they will move with you. And as we said, this is, can be a systemic thing can, that can cause them to generally feel poor, um, feel you know tired, and just not feel well at all. So it's, it's encouraged that nurses kind of try to teach them how to work with that. Um, you know, allow them for rest periods, but can, you know, encourage them to continue to move. You know, healthy lifestyle. They need a good diet decreased alcohol, decreased smoking, all those things are just going to make their symptoms worse. So they need to live a healthy life, have a good balanced diet, don't smoke, don't drink on top of all of this or it's not, you know, it's going to be a lot more difficult to treat them. So we're going to continue on to talk about gout. Gout is included in this module because it is a form of arthritis. It's a disorder related to something called hyperuricemia. This means that there's a high level of urate crystals in the blood that begin to deposit in the joints and other body tissues causing inflammation. So uh, there's a lot of inflammation in gouty arthritis and they're due to your 
urate crystals that are in the blood, something called hyperuricemia. Primary gout is the most common type and results from one of several errors of purine metabolism. So essentially what happens is there are some people who just don't metabolize um, uric acid, which leads to a buildup of the urate crystals in the blood that begin to, to get deposited into the joints and cause the inflammation. So it's, it's sort of just a genetic disposition to have a poor metabolism of uric acid. So in primary gout, the production of uric acid exceeds the excretion capability of the kidneys, so that it builds up in the body. So it's thought to be very genetic. Um, males are affected more than females. Sometimes hyperuricemia or the buildup of urate crystals in the blood can be secondary to another disorder, such as renal insufficiency, so maybe the kidneys just don't work correctly. Um, or diets, specific diets that patients are on. So that would be a secondary cause of it. One thing to note about gout is that it is extremely, extremely painful. An ac acute gout is when um, the patient has obvious signs and symptoms. Chronic gout is related to just the patient having elevated uric acid levels chronically, uh, and it's called acute when they have an acute exacerbation of the inflamed joints. This is a picture of what those uric acid buildup in the joint looks like and why it is so extremely painful. Um, like at this patient here would be, this would be so painful that if the bed sheet touched their foot, they'll scream out in pain. It is very, very, very inflamed and very, very painful. This is a common joint that is affected by gout. It's typically the hand or the big toe. The joint of the great toe is one of the most common joints affected by gout. There's another disorder related to gout that is called um, chronic tophaceous gout. And this is after repeated episodes of acute gout, deposits of urate crystals develop under the skin and within the major organs, particularly in the renal system. And there's um, it basically they develop these topical appearance of tophi, which are just little white spots. Um, and that is an indicator of chronic gout in a patient. Gout can be treated effectively if the patient is compliant. Drug therapy for gout includes anti-inflammatory, of course, because remember, it is an inflammatory response. One of the major ways, though, to treat gout is to teach the patient some lifestyle changes. Uric acid buildup in the blood occurs due to a high intake of a purine diet. Purines is what breaks down into uric acid in the blood. So the patient needs to, if they can change their diet, to have a low purine diet. Um, in your book, and I think I have a slide here that has um, foods that they should avoid. So typically it means organ meats, shellfish, oily fish, like sardines. Alcohol has a lot of purine in it, so they should avoid um, drinking alcohol. They should avoid eating organ meats and shellfish and oily fish such as sardines. That can, that can itself decrease the episodes of acute gout in a patient. Excessive stress can also cause an exacerbation, so try to help the patient, um, you know, lead a healthy lifestyle with decreased stress. They should drink plenty of fluids to make sure that they are hydrated well and hydrating their kidneys to make sure that the kidneys can work to decrease the uric acid levels. Medication for an acute exacerbation is a little bit different than chronic. For acute exacerbation of gout, um, of course, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications are going to be given with caution, minding to make sure they don't have GI upset.
an acute exacerbation, a patient may be put on something called colchis. Oh, I guess spell this right. Um, colchicine and endomethacin. Those two are um, typical drugs given for an acute exacerbation of gout. It's a combination of a uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory med. If a patient has chronic, has been diagnosed with several repeated episodes of gout, they will be given a medication as a continuous maintenance to promote uric acid excretion. Um, or to reduce its production. Allopurinol is one of those drugs, so it's not an anti-inflammatory med. It's more of a med that decreases uric acid production. Patients taking these medications should make sure they drink at least eight glasses of water each day to make sure their kidneys stay healthy. This is just also a, a summary, just a visual to um, help you to understand foods that are high in purine and the kinds of foods that the patient should avoid. So all of these foods listed here should be avoided in a patient who has had exacerbations of gout um, because they have high purine in them which can cause the, the uric acid levels to increase and cause an exacerbation. So um, this is really the key to preventing acute episodes in patients with gout. Um, they, um, if they can do this, they can definitely decrease their pain um, in, in the amount of exacerbations that they have. So just going through this case study um, to just kind of assess your learning and understanding of the content in this presentation. So let's talk about a 63-year-old woman. She comes to a, an acute medical care unit. She's 5'4". She weighs 211 pounds. Her medical history includes hypertension and GERD, GERD being gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it means she's got a little GI irritation. On admission, she reports pain in her hands and joints. It's unrelieved by over-the-counter medications. What additional assessment data should you collect from the patient at this time? So think about that and remember, what did we talk about as far as assessing? So we know it's, what do we know? What do we know so far? Let's think about this. She's 63. She's a woman. Those are major things. She's 5'4", and she weighs 211. To me, if I worked out that BMI, if I did that on my calculator, to me, I believe she would be obese. Um, she has high blood pressure, and she has a, a stomach upset. Um, so that's her history. On a mission, she reports that her both of her hands and joints are un, are painful and she's taken some over-the-counter stuff um, that's not a, not effective so additional um, things think about what you would ask I might ask when did it start how long has this been going on exactly what kind of over-the-counter medications you have been taking um, is it bilateral is it do you have you had a general feeling of um, not feeling well? Have you ran a fever? Are your joints swollen and warm? What kind of family history do you have? Um, have you had any trauma to these areas? Um, so think about that. You might come up with a few more than that, but just think about other questions that you would have for her. Does it cause a decreased range of motion? How much is this, is this affecting your ability every day? Is it worse in the morning or is it worse in the afternoon? Think about what that would indicate. A patient with rheumatoid arthritis, remember I said they have stiffness that typically affects them early in the morning and they're better off after they start moving. A patient with osteoarthritis um, is degenerative and due to excessive um, movement of the, of the joint. So sometimes their pain is actually worse in the afternoon after they've been up and moving around. Um, so it's that constant movement, that degeneration, and it typically affects them later in the day. So think about all those things you would ask her. 
And just looking at this, um, it looks like I forgot to put the picture in. So we'll talk about this in class a little bit. I'll bring up, remind me to bring up this picture in class and we'll talk about what these hands look like because it is very imperative um, that we look at this picture. So we will bring up this case study in class and look at these hands and talk about what that might, what we, how we would document those. Okay, so we went ahead and, and you know, part of the assessment is um, doing labs on a patient. So two hours later, um, we look at these labs and the results are as follows. So hopefully you've kind of looked at the normal values for these labs. Uh, noting that 136 for sodium is normal, so check. Typical normal potassium levels is usually 3.5 to 5, so got a good potassium level here. Calcium levels, typical normals for that is about 8 to 10, so she's good there. And moving on to hematocrit, which is the volume of red blood cells compared to the total blood volume. Um, is 40 to, well, that's for men. So women, it's 36 to 48. So she falls right in there on that one. HGB stands for hemoglobin, which is a protein molecule in the red blood cells. It carries oxygen to the body's tissues. Normal hemoglobin in an adult woman. It's typically 12 to 16, so hers is good. ESR. What is a normal ESR? Remember, it stands for erythrocyte sedimentation rate. An elevated ESR can indicate inflammation in the body. Most references say an ESR of 28. It if a, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate is greater than 20, it indicates an elevation and can indicate inflammation in this patient. So this would be of concern. So looking at this question, during a health history assessment, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, she has chronic hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and diagnosis of a recent cerebrovascular accident, which is a stroke. She's taking fish oil capsules as a supplement for her rheumatoid arthritis. What additional questions should the nurse ask? This is a kind of a high level question, but we'll walk through this. So what do we know? Um, we know that the patient has, she has rheumatoid arthritis, she has high blood pressure. She's had a stroke. A stroke typically will indicate that a patient has had a clot, a blood clot in their brain, which could mean that to prevent her from having any further strokes, she might be taking blood thinning medication. So basically what we're talking about here is a patient who is taking a supplement. So fish oil is just a supplement. Um, Fish oil supplement has been known to um, be one of those supplements that do, does decrease, that's helped, helps to decrease inflammation and prevent bone loss for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So a good question to ask is, is it helpful? Has it helped you at all? Um, the first one, so that would be one of them that we would ask. Is this helping you? And then um, it, fish oil. And really, with all supplements, you should always ask them if they're taking anticoagulant medication. She has a reason for maybe being on an anticoagulant medication. Um, but a, lot, a lot of anticoagulants have... Um, contraindications with some with with supplements so anytime anybody's taking any anticoagulant medication um, look at the supplements that they're taking and um, look at all the other medications that they're taking because um, anticoagulant medication is known to have um, drug to drug interaction with a lot of other medicines so that's always a good question to ask what other supplements do you currently take? Well, sure, let's ask that because the reason we need to ask that is because when she's taking one, she's probably taking more, and we need to make sure that they're safe to take together. How long have you been taking them? Well, sure, that's probably not a bad idea either. Basically, what this question is about, and have you notified your physician? Absolutely, that question needs to be asked. So all of these questions are appropriate. So the answer is A, B, C, and D. A, A, B, C, D, Annie. <laughs> A, B, C, D, Annie. These are all correct questions. 
Um, and basically what this question is about is what, when somebody is taking a supplement, you need to make sure that you explore what supplement they're taking, what other medications they're taking, if it's helpful, and if their physician knows. It's an education piece. So basically this question is um, you have a patient with osteoarthritis and um, the nurse is the family clinic nurse is teaching a client about a newly diagnosed osteoarthritis. And they're talking about the drugs used to treat the disease. Which medication does the nurse plan primary teaching? So which one of these drugs essentially is appropriate for osteoarthritis? Is acetaminophen? Well, yes, acetaminophen is appropriate because, remember, let's talk about these other meds. I don't know if you look this med up, but this is flexural. This is a muscle relaxer. Does a patient with muscle rela with osteoarthritis need a muscle relaxer? No. This other med here, Hyalgan is actually a medication that can treat osteoarthritis. However, it is typically used for those patients who have failed to respond to conservative pharmacologic therapy. So it's it's more for those, it would not be for a newly diagnosed patient. Ibuprofen, well, it's a non steroidal anti-inflammatory um, medication. Could it be appropriate? Yes, but remember what we said about non-steroidals. That is usually for a, a more... Um, severe osteoarthritis that has developed into a synovial inflammation. This is a newly diagnosed patient. We're going to start out with Tylenol for that patient. For this question, we're talking about an older client who comes back to this from the surgical unit after a total hip replacement. Patient's confused and restless, which can happen after surgery at times. What intervention by the nurse is the most important to, thing to do to prevent injury? We talk about intervention, that means we have to do something. Um, it means some, some kind of action that we're gonna do. So, if the total hip, should we administer a mild sedation? Well, possibly, because they're confused and restless, however, if you're talking about an older client, an older client may respond a little bit more harsh to a mild sedation, so I don't know that that should be our first line of treatment. Keep all four side rails up. Whew. If we do that, if your patient tries to climb over those four side rails because they're confused and restless, they're going to have a big fall, so not necessarily the best thing to do. Restrain the client's hands. Well, is that really the problem here? Um, do we really need to restrain them? Possibly. Um, but the one thing that's the most important thing is this abduction pillow. If you look at the post-op care of a patient with a hip surgery, a total hip replacement, um, we don't, we want to prevent them from abducting because they can refracture their hip. They can damage that. We want that, that hip to be aligned. We don't want them doing a 90 degree angle. We want them to keep their hip aligned. So that's the most important. Let's do that abductor pillow and then let's assess what we can do. Because what we're doing there is we're making sure that that total hip replacement doesn't get damaged in any way. Um, and then after we do that abductor pillow, then we can kind of look at maybe what else we need to do for the confusion and restlessness. And we typically, you know, want to keep the patient safe. We don't want to just go straight for restraining them ever. Um, maybe just kind of some do some reorientation and assess what medications they've had. It might just be that we need to let some of the um, anesthesia wear off from the surgery um, and just kind of monitor the patient very, very closely. But the abductor pillow is very important in the event that a patient has a total hip replacement. This concludes this presentation for Nursing 150. I hope this has been helpful in your understanding of these disease processes, and I look forward to discussing them more in, your, in the classroom.